Memories are not everlasting. They fade away, change, and get mixed up. After a few years, you are left with this general blob of memories with a mix of different emotions and pieces. But there are some moments in your life that are just too powerful to be kept as a blob. You remember everything, the weather, the time, the place, and even the air. Your brain captures every single moment of the event as a video clip, and it's stuck in your head for the rest of your life. I have such a moment that dates back to nine years ago when I was in second grade. It was the day of my first math competition ever. And I was pretty nervous because I felt I wasn't best when it came to math. After the competition, I knew I wasn't winning the grand prize, but I still felt pretty good that it was finally over. So I hopped onto my dad's car with a smile on my face and told my parents that I did pretty good. But the moment my eyes met my mom's, I knew something wasn't right. Her father, who was my grandfather, had passed away that day. I was never so close with my grandfather, mostly because I didn't get to see him often. Even my oldest memories of him are from the time after he fell sick, when he was lying on the hospital bed, unable to move or speak properly. Besides, I was too little to really comprehend the meaning behind death. But I didn't know that my mom cried that day. I've never seen her cry so much before. And those drops of tears that streamed down my mom's face were what pinned that day into my memory to be kept not as a blob, but as a video clip. It was my first encounter with death and with sadness. It was also my first encounter with neurodegenerative diseases. My grandfather passed away from Parkinson's. My dream back then was to become a doctor. I didn't know enough to really understand what doctors did, but I just had this vague desire that I wanted to help those who were in desperate need of help. And one of my friends who knew of this dream I had gave me a book for my birthday. Not many kids like it when they receive a book for a birthday gift, but luckily for her, I was one of those weird types who preferred reading over playing video games, although not anymore. It was a biography on the neurologist Ben Carson, focusing on his unfortunate youth and his efforts to overcome it. But what really captivated me were the descriptions of the brain surgeries. My personal favorite was the one about a four-year-old girl named Miranda Francisco, a girl suffering from 120 seizures a day. Ben Carson decided it was necessary to chop out the left half of her brain. It was a surgery with high risks. The left hemisphere had a lot to do with language function, and there was a high chance she would never be able to speak again, even if the surgery was successful. Miranda retrieved her ability to speak right after the surgery. Her right hemisphere took over the lost language function of the badly damaged left hemisphere. I was mesmerized by the story and by the MRI picture of her brain. I couldn't help but stare into that black void where her left hemisphere was supposed to be. I read that page over and over again until I could recall her face without looking at her photo. From that day, I grew a strange obsession for the human brain. I had yet another chance to become closer friends with the human brain. When I was in fifth grade, I was a part of the Gifted Science Education Center of Seoul National University of Education. And there I learned about this thing called Brain Awareness Week. Every March, partners of this campaign share 
host many different activities to share the wonders of the brain and the impact neuroscience has on our life. I attended a forum hosted by Korea University. It was my first encounter with patient HM. In short, patient HM was an American man who underwent a surgery that removed parts of his brain to cure severe epilepsy. The operation did succeed in controlling his epilepsy, but there was an unforeseen side effect. He was no longer able to form new memories. Upon hearing his story, I couldn't think of memories as the same way I did before. I tried to imagine what it would be like to be unable to create new memories. And the 11-year-old me concluded that it would be the same as being dead. And it was around this time that my grandma was diagnosed with dementia. I didn't know much about dementia, but I did know it had a lot to do with her memories. I wondered if she was going to forget things. I wondered if she was going to forget me. I wondered how someone could forget their beloved family members and the sweet memories they had together. Then I wonder what it would feel like to slowly lose grasp of everything you loved, like a pile of sand slipping through your fingers. I wondered what it would feel like if it happened to me. This fear of losing memories, combined with the strange obsession for the human brain I had grown earlier, seemed to scream at my face that I had to study more about it. I was both scared and mesmerized by what our brain could and could not do. So the next year, I joined a three-week summer camp called Sensory Brain, hosted by the Center for Talented Youth of Johns Hopkins University, which I still refer to as the best three weeks of my entire life. I had a chance to dissect a cow's eye and a sheep's brain, an amazing experience that still lingers around after five full years. But after the camp, as much as I wanted to continue studying neuroscience, I didn't have much time and mind space to spend on it. Seventh grade flew by as I was trying my best to earn straight A's while traveling all around the United States at the same time. And upon returning to South Korea, I focused more on studying for my school rather than for my own interests. I did read many inspiring books and my passion for neuroscience never died out, but it was just that I had other things to prioritize over it. It wasn't until ninth grade that life pushed me further toward the field of neuroscience. As I said earlier, my grandma was already diagnosed with dementia a few years ago, but her conditions didn't seem to deteriorate so much over time. I did notice some changes in her behavior and she did have some difficulties trying to recall certain pieces of information, but it wasn't as bad as what I had anticipated. Her dementia, which had caused an immense fear of losing memories in my younger self, seemed to fade away from existence. Things started going downhill when I became a freshman, and things went downhill fast. As for my grandma, dementia hit her more on the personality side than on the memory side. Her conditions deteriorated significantly in a matter of a few days despite the medication she was taking. And soon, she wasn't able to perform daily activities like eating, changing, or going to the restroom by herself. One of my parents had to accompany her at all times, and even with their help, she seemed to have trouble performing the simplest tasks out there. It was a sudden bang on my head that reminded me of her illness that was fading away for years in my mind. But it wasn't that same fear that had overwhelmed me years ago when she was first diagnosed. It was more of pain, sadness, and anger that some people had to go through this, this process of losing loved ones of self. 
My passion for neuroscience was once again ignited. I had to learn what was causing this awful and painful experience that my family was experiencing. So I enrolled myself to Korean Brain Camp. And much of what I know now about the human brain and the nervous system comes from this time when I was frantically reading every material I can about the brain and especially about the diseases related to the brain. And I enrolled to an online course called Unquiet Minds, again hosted by Center for Talented Youth of Johns Hopkins University, in which I could learn about the basics of diagnosing brain diseases. My passion for neuroscience that was based on nothing finally had a solid ground, some actual information about how the human brain worked. And with this basic knowledge, I decided to move on to what I believe to be my destiny. I started volunteering for the elderly who are in the early stages of neurodegenerative diseases. There, I met many people who are in the same stage of illness as my grandma when she was first diagnosed. And the more I interacted with them, the more I realized that it was indeed possible with an early diagnosis to slow down the progress of these diseases, but medication alone wouldn't work. These patients were in need of social interaction and cognitive stimuli that could be provided by volunteers without expert knowledge. I was both amazed and shocked by how the deterioration of these patients' conditions seemed to slow down stop even compared to when I first met them. And all I did was talking with them, hanging out with them, and having fun. And that's all it takes. Understanding and sympathizing with the patients and their family members, spending a few moments on the phone to provide the social interaction they need, spending a few moments at the volunteer center to provide the cognitive stimuli they need. That's all it takes to improve these people's life condition by so much and to lessen the pain felt by the patients and their family members by so much. I was so shocked at how simple my task was. And I was so shocked how so many people around the world were suffering because this simple task was not being done. Let's throw in some numbers here. According to World Population Prospects, the population of 60 and over were 757 million in 2020. But this number will double to 1.5 billion by 2050. And with this increase of older population will come an increase of the patients diagnosed with neurological disorders. Take dementia, for example. According to World Health Organization, the population of patients diagnosed with dementia were 55 million in 2020. And this number will double every 20 years, hitting 78 million in 2030 and 139 million in 2050. So what do these numbers tell us? Well, it's pretty evident that the numerical evidence gives us a glimpse into the future that we will have to soon face an increasing number of elder population with an increasing number of patients suffering from neurological disorders. So what can we do about it? These new degenerative diseases are neither curable nor preventable in terms of the medical technologies we have now. But I'm telling you from my own experience with my own family members and the volunteer work I do, that there are things we can do as non-experts to minimize the impact of these destructive diseases. The importance of awareness can never be overstated. You have to be aware that this can be you or your family member, not in the far future, but next year or even next month. Awareness enables people to get an early diagnosis, massively improving the chance to slow down the progress of these diseases. Awareness allows people to realize that there are things they can do to improve the quality of life for so many other people. Start out with your own family members, your mom, 
dad, grandma, grandpa, any elder relative you might have. Take a few minutes to give them a phone call because those few minutes make a change. Take a few hours off your weekend break and go to the local volunteer center because those few hours make a change. And that's all it takes to make a difference. Thank you for listening.